And we are recording. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is our second edition of uh, Florida Tech Scuba Club Speaker Series. Tonight, we have with us Dr. Selena McMillan. She is the Southern California Regional Manager for Reef Check California. Uh, just a little bit about some context. Florida Tech Scuba Club is a student organization here at the Florida Institute of Technology located in Melbourne, Florida. We are a student organization dedicated to recreational scuba diving that serves as a pipeline to scientific diving, scientific diving and, and professional development, professional through, development scuba. through scuba. The speaker series helps bring together professionals in the industry to share their experiences in navigating academia and the professional world to help best inform the members and everybody else involved in the Florida Tech community. So welcome. Uh, a bit of housekeeping, Dr. Selena McMillan has agreed to uh, take questions at any time. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to um, use the hand raise feature or drop your question into the chat. This is being recorded. And for those who may not be able to make it live uh, currently, the recording will be uh, uploaded to YouTube for us to share as well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. McMillan. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. And I'm really happy to hear all about all the stuff you guys have been doing out in Florida. Um, and um, yeah, and so Anesti told me, asked me, didn't tell me, he asked me to come and talk to you guys about just my experiences uh, navigating uh, this world of, um, you know, deciding what you want to do in life and then how to, uh, how to get there um you know you have a dream but it's sometimes hard to navigate um what uh what things you need to do to be able to make that uh come true so um i'm just going to you know casually talk about and uh i have a lot of pictures some of them didn't transfer over because some of the powerpoints are so old because i'm old um that they didn't come over very, uh, very easily so i'll try to describe the pictures that i had but for the most part i'm just going to take you through a journey of my academic career um, basically. And then, so if you have any questions along the way, please uh, feel free to uh, speak up and ask me. Um, and also, I'll uh, then take you into what I'm currently doing now, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and and nesty has uh, uh, been a big part of it and, and is continuing to be a, a big part of, of, of uh, our organization and what we do. So I'll give you a little background on that and then tell you what we're up to currently. And then you'll be so convinced to come that to come out to dive in California. California, you'll, you'll forget that it's colder than Florida. So um, yeah, so without further ado, let me share my screen with you. Make sure it's the right one. Uh, yep, there you go. Um, and I'll start the slideshow. And there we go. Can everybody see that? Excellent. Yeah, we, can, I'm guessing. we can see okay, it. It's excellent. a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's laid out a little different than most PowerPoints, though. It's like a, in a presenter view instead of display view. Oh, I see why. Thank you for telling me. Um, yeah, I was just telling Anesti since I added this new. Um, let if, you me go to, if you go to slideshow. Yeah, you'll just take a second. Yeah, if you go to slideshow in the top corner. Yeah, don't worry. Hold on. Uh, it's OK. I've got this. OK. Uh, and then share, and then um, we're gonna share this one. Okay. Okay, now do you just see the PowerPoint? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I am Selena McMillan. I'm going to give you a talk. So I was born in Texas. I was born in Austin, Texas. So a little landlocked except for a uh, big Gulf of Mexico. That's not really uh, what you would uh, pick as a destination dive spot, except for the floor, uh, the flower gardens, which I have not been to. Um, but anyway, yeah, but you can tell from my happy face that I still love the ocean and the beach. And I was very much a water baby growing up, but I did uh, live in, in Texas and uh, start my college career there. Um, but whenever I was uh, at in Waco, Texas, actually going to Baylor University, I still managed to 
uh, once I had that idea in my head that I wanted to become a marine biologist, I still managed to try and um, take all of the courses that would lead me to uh, be able to transfer to a different university where I could get a marine biology degree. So I started off doing biology, but I also took courses in like uh, geology and oceanography and um, and then started um, uh, learn, uh, making my way into um, uh, like field, any kind of field oriented um, courses that I could take. Um, I started doing that because I felt like um, it would give me that experience and it did. It, it gave me the, the experiences and the connections that I needed. So I ended up going to Jamaica, learning how to dive and going to Jamaica um, and, um, and doing um, diving there and learning about oceanography and the relationship between time and the present. And uh, then from there, um, I, I then um, went to uh, the University of Santa Cruz, and this is a picture of the of, of right at the beginning of the Big Sur Coast um, in the intertidal. So um, I uh, moved there, and then again I I changed my um, degree to marine biology, but I immediately dove, uh, pardon the pun, into uh, as much diving as I could. I became a scientific diver. Um, I started taking all the opportunities I could as far as internships and, and work study um, uh, 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 jobs that would get me into the labs and into uh, the diving um, uh, volunteer ships that I could get to, to accrue the um, the experience and because it was fun and I met tons of people and got really close with um, um, the professors who ran the programs that I was part of. Um, so I felt that that was really valuable to do that. Um, and then again, I was also really um, uh, uh, adamant about making sure to, to apply, this one you had to apply for, uh, apply or uh, sign up for all those courses that took me into the field. So this is one of those courses that was a combined ichthyology and marine ecology course that we um, did our field work in Morea. So that wasn't a bad deal. Um, but yeah, it was really fun and, and highly encourage it. And for all of these, I have to tell you, I uh, was a poor white girl from Texas. I was also um, a uh, um, a mother um, of two. Um, so I was going to school with two, with a toddler and a young child um, during all of this and, and, and applying and poor, very poor and living in California, which a nesting knows, it makes you even poorer than you ever thought you could be, um, especially with children. So I, um, I definitely encourage all, all of you from whatever background that you are, whether you're a female, whether you're, you're diverse, whether you um, are you know, a re-entering student that has children, there are opportunities out there for you to be able to uh, do these things and get scholarships to do them. So um, that's basically how I, I was able to make it all work. Um, and through the help of, of the friends that I met who were good babysitters and also really good, um, good classmates as well. So that may that moves me on to after I graduated from uh, UCSC, uh, go slugs, University of California at Santa Cruz, I then um, uh, went into uh, a graduate student student program um, at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Uh, it's a consortium of California State Universities, uh, very well known, very, very respected and, and lots of uh, um, amazing people have, have graduated from that program. However, it is notorious for being the longest master's thesis program you can ever uh, be in. But that said, I was there for a while, but I also was able to participate in many, many different um, uh, uh, parts of the field. So I did stuff in oceanography, I did stuff in fisheries, I did so, uh, you know, either uh, through work, uh, through grants, or, or just like volunteering to help friends out, you know, with their projects. So um, my project was looking at the trophic interactions among Macrocystis periphera, which is that huge giant kelp that you see in the picture here, and Chlorostoma burnea, which I think is now back to Tegula burnea because they change names all the time, and marine, uh, and marine fungi. So the, the idea is that this fungus, uh, the, the snails themselves, this little guy, is coming in and chewing on uh, the blades of the kelp. And then um, eventually he goes away, the, this marine fungi comes in and starts uh, mowing on, on the kelp. And it actually makes it much more palatable um, for the snail. 
well and and um way um you know it's seasoned now it's like a nice nice fermented cheese um and the snail will come back and just mow it down so that was uh like three years of my life figuring all of that out. So it wasn't just immediate, uh, but it was really neat. And it was a, it was a, a really heavily uh, uh, dive uh, oriented thesis. Um, so here you can see the snails coming in and, and doing their thing and, and mowing down the, the kelp. Um, the, and yeah, so um, yeah. So once I graduated from that, finally, um, I, I wanted to do a PhD. I looked at opportunities to do uh, in fact, one in Florida, one in Gainesville, one in Santa Barbara, one in Santa Cruz, but I ended up getting a full scholarship to go to um, the University of uh, Auckland in New Zealand uh, to look at uh, herbivorous reef fish. Um, and so um, scholarships are a big thing, uh, not having to get more, more um, uh, student loans or beg for grants or anything um, to have 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 it already ready to go and a project or already ready to go um, really um, uh, it called out to me so um, me and my two children I was a single mom at that point and my two children and I we went to uh, all the way uh, down south to New Zealand and um, and here's where I was able to um, uh, to do work sorry there's a picture of a really pretty boat that we used um, here, but um, in within the Haraki Gulf. So their um, system is very much like California. It's a temperate reef system. There's kelp, uh, there's fish that look very similar to ours because it is the Pacific Ocean on that side, right? Um, and so we did um, our, our work uh, here, uh, mainly at Great Barrier, um, uh, spearfishing fish for my project, looking at uh, hind gut microbes and and um, and fish, and then we also and this was a big seller for me to take the scholarship and go to New Zealand. Uh, we also traveled to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia to Lizard Island, and we did um, we did a, a two uh, two to three week trips there to collect samples for uh, for my project. Um, and then basically the project was about petition, uh, potential nutritional and biochemical pathways. I used stable isotopes, I used amino acids, I used compound spe specific stable isotopes, uh, my microscopy. So it was a lot more lab work than I was ever used to, um, that's for sure. Uh, and, and basically it was looking at this like internal trophic uh, interaction that happens within the system of the fish. So it eats the seaweed, uh, the seaweed can do two things. It can go directly assimilated and go directly to the fish, or it can be broken down by uh, microflora in the guts of these fish, of these herbivorous uh, fish, and then and then that in turn turns to into short chain fatty, fatty acids and goes uh, to the fish. But the question that we had was whether or not um, uh, uh, they assimilated proteins in a similar way that had never been shown. And what we ended up finding is not only do they that yes they they make nitrogen available uh, to the fish, the the microflora, the the microorganisms, but they they also, um, it was the first time we've ever seen um, uh, microbes, bacteria that can um, uh, alter uh, inorganic nitrogen to, to organic nitrogen, kind of like what you think of in the um, in like um, the nodes of, of, of roots that make the nitrogen available. So this is the first time we've seen this internally in a in vertebrate in a vertebrate. We've seen it in um, in weird things like shipworms and and uh, and a couple of other like insects. But um, this was the first time. So it was uh, ended up being way more interesting than we thought. And then finally, once I finished my dissertation, finally in New Zealand, I moved back and moved to uh, to Santa Barbara. This was uh, my last house that I just moved from, uh, with the view of the Channel Islands in the background. Um, and I started working for Reef Check. So I'm just going to give you a little background on on Reef Check and uh, um, and what we do. So to start out with, Reef Check. Uh, um, was concerned about the what we all are concerned about, which is like the overfishing and the, what the status of of uh, reefs worldwide was, um, and and just to, to ask that question about how is our ocean doing? And and back uh, when Reef Check started, 
um, we didn't really, we had, it was very data poor and it still is in some areas, but very data poor on uh, understanding what was actually happening. Um, and that, that, you know, was definitely focused on, on uh, coral reefs uh, and then later on, um, on, on uh, our kelp forest. Um, so basically it was, it was, we had a lack of data to really understand what was going on. So uh, reef check was, uh, was uh, um, created uh, to bring um, that uh, um, ability to capture that information by training uh, uh, people. And, and, and that, that could be in, in different ways, whether it's uh, training people to do research, uh, training people through education, um, and then also just working with uh, different uh, uh, communities and um, also, you know, interested parties who want to help uh, with the oceans in conservation and different things. So we have things like uh, line, we, we work with um, elimination of lionfish and then outplanting coral and those kinds of things. Um, uh, so the reef check scientists can be anybody. Um, uh, in some parts of the world, you they can even be um, uh, free divers or snorkelers. Uh, but for the most part, they're divers, um, and especially here, uh, there in Florida with you guys, and then here in, in California. Um, and it's just based. It, it's it's teaching people who aren't. Uh, scientists to uh, have the skills to be able to collect data and therefore they're called citizen scientists, right? Um, and so our, mo our monitor monitoring protocol in uh, coral reefs like what you have in Florida, um, we look at fish and then the substrate, uh, what's on the bottom, and then uh, we, we do uh, counts of invertebrates. And these are just a few of the many, many invertebrates that we, um, that we uh, sample. And, and we pick these, uh, these invertebrates and fish and algae um, uh, based on, um, we call them indicator species. And that we, we choose those based on things like, um, are they fished? Um, are they eco ecologically important? Uh, are they easy to see and very conspicuous? Uh, we have a few things on our, on our list, or we just have them on there. They may not make a huge impact um, on the reef, but people really want to count them because they can see them and they're pretty. So um, we have a couple of those as well. Um, so it, across the world, we have a lot of different chapters and we uh, are currently updating our, our database, but this will be the address once it's, uh, once it's fixed. And you can see uh, the 90 plus territories and uh, countries that we uh, have, have worked in. So our successes, we've done over 10,000, uh, uh, more than that now, 10,000 surveys uh, across the world in 90, plus countries and territories. Uh, we have about uh, 6,300 6, uh, eco divers, which is what we call our people that are trained to do reef check survey, surveys. Um, and then we have about uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, NGOs around uh, the world uh, that do reef check. Um, we again have a, a, a database where all of this data all the way from 1997 is housed and it has been used uh, many, many times for research and uh, infor informing management. Um, so it, it's actually a very, very valuable long term monitoring um, effort in several different places across the world. And then now we have about uh, over 60 sensors deployed. So with the, uh, the you know, imminent uh, uh, threat of climate change and what we've already experienced from climate change and what may happen, we need to really um, uh, get a, a, a very clear understanding of, of the changes that are happening. And so um, we, we definitely moved into that area of starting to implement uh, temperature loggers and pH sensors and O2 sensors and those kinds of things um, across our, our uh, areas. Um, so these are just, I'm not gonna read through any of these. This is just giving you uh, a few ideas of, of the different um, countries and what uh, they're doing. Um, so that was Dominican Republic and then we have uh, Grenada and Malaysia, who we're working with right now to uh, to grow even larger, um, and then then how to get involved. Uh, so you can go to our website. It actually looks a little different than this. We just launched a new one, um, and it should be a little bit easier to navigate. But you can just choose where you're interested or what you want to hear, and then uh, or learn about, and then that will take you to uh, to a place where you can learn more and how to get involved.
And then um, I'll tell you what I do. So I'm in California and we do Reef Check California here. Uh, it was established in 2006 uh, to basically do what the Reef Check Foundation was doing in the coral reefs, uh, but now in uh, California, um, and uh, which is train uh, vol di dive, uh, volunteer divers to become citizen scientists and collect data along our rocky reefs and kelp forest. Um, especially given that we were implementing these things called marine protected areas um, along, all along the up and down the coast of California. So it was really important that we were gathering information inside and outside of those areas so that way we could do a comparison of how well that uh, those marine protected areas were doing, right? Um, so uh, this is all, well, this is a, a very simple, a map of all of our sites along the coast and all the way actually up into Oregon. Now we have a few sites in Oregon and next year we're going to be sneaking down into Baja. So that'll be exciting. Um, and then we do a training. Um, it's pretty rigorous. Uh, um, I mean, we're really, we're really honestly uh, speed training people to become semi-scientific divers. So it's not a full AUS uh, course. However, we just got accepted. Uh, to be part of uh, the AUS, um, if you don't know, American Association of Underwater Scientists Association. Um, so we will, in the future, have the ability um, to, uh, to, to, to teach AUS courses, but our scientific training, our citizen science training is in the AUS manual now. So it is part of, of the of AUS. Um, however, you need further training to become an actual scientific uh, diver. Um, so we teach you a little bit about marine ecology, about kelp forest, oceanography, currents, all that kind of stuff, fisheries management and MPAs, which is important because that's what you're going to be sampling. Um, and then it's an intensive for, uh, four or more day training. It's uh, usually two days in a classroom um, and a pool, but that's changed a little bit with COVID. So now we do online um, uh, stuff and then uh, check out in the ocean. Um, and, then, and then two or more days in the open ocean. Um, so uh, volunteers are tested for every single survey type that we have, and then they're certified for that survey type if they pa if they're able to uh, collect uh, the da a data that's similar enough to uh, to our seasoned veterans. Um, uh, and that way, we're not biasing the data, and we're also uh, getting getting good quality data every year. And every year, our uh, vol reef check volunteers have to go through a recertification. So basically it's like a mini training all over again to dust those cobwebs out of your brain and uh, remember all of that stuff that you might have forgotten over Christmas and last year and then get you back in the water, make sure all your gear works and then let you know if there's been any protocol changes within the last year. Um, so Reef Check California training teaches a scientific method. Uh, it's an approach uh, recognized by our uh, fish and wildlife or fish and game. Um, and uh, it's the protocol compar comparable to academic research. Basically, it's the same, almost the same uh, protocol that I used whenever I was working for uh, an academic research um, uh, a group here in California for, for years. Um, so it's very similar. It's just uh, typically those groups count everything and we count uh, a lot, but just a subset of that. So um, uh, to make it a little bit uh, easier for our volunteers. Um, and then of course, there's been a paper comparing it and saying uh, our, our um, surveys to uh, academically um, uh, garnered surveys and, and they're, they're, there's no difference. So that's great. Uh, so Reef Check California training, we train recreational divers, we train commercial fishermen, a lot of agency uh, uh, staff like uh, NOAA and uh, aquariums and, uh, um, and uh, fish and wildlife come and, and take our, our training. Um, and then uh, especially university students like yourself um, and uh, AUS students, um, all those guys, you only have to be a, a, a recreational diver to take Reef Check. Um, but we do work closely with university um, with universities, and so that's a big part of our um, our reach. And these are just a few of the many uh, institutions and aquariums and uh, and universities and colleges that we work with. Uh, so this is a little dated, but um, the statewide citizen 
uh, monitoring program has been going on for 13 years now of data in, inside and outside of MPAs. Um, over 128 sites have been surveyed along the coast uh, and many of those for five or years or more. And we have about 58, I think that's still right, 58 within the marine protected areas that were implemented. Uh, so annually we do about 90 sites. We still managed somehow to do that last year. I have no idea how it happened, but it did uh, with all of the COVID and closures and beach closures, but we made made it work. Um, and we usually, usually typically, except for last year when we couldn't train people, um, uh, train about 250, 50 volunteers per year. Um, so this is just a little uh, flow chart that just shows you how important volunteer participation can be, um, especially compared to smaller groups like academic groups uh, that don't have a lot of people um, and, and don't have the same reach that we do. So over the last decade, over a thousand volunteers uh, in California have participated in surveys. Um, and many more went to the, through the training and didn't necessarily participate, but they through that training, they gained a very, very solid knowledge of, of what's going on in their backyard uh, and, and usually come out of it, even if they decide that they don't want to continue diving with us, they usually come out of, out of it with a, a really um, um, a great uh, uh, appreciation for, for what we do. Um, and so that all of that equals about 8,000 volunteer days that have been um, that have been uh, uh, completed by our volunteers. And in reality, that equals 30 years of full time work uh, that's been done by our citizen scientists. So you can see it's an amazing amount of effort that is made um, through our program. Um, so, like I said, this is all. Um, this is what it looks like. It'll look similar to this, but whenever it does come up, uh, we will have a place that you can literally go to and click on one of our sites, and and it'll uh, allow you to pull up different uh, and create different um, different graphs, so you can see uh, differences among uh, fish and kelp and you know whatever whatever your interests lie. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, uh, this uh, MPA baseline. I've talked a lot about uh, MPAs, but one of the most important things about implementing marine protected areas is knowing what was there before. So you can see change over time. So for us, um, we've you know been in existence since 2006. Uh, a lot of those MPAs came in you know 2011 to 2015. Um, so we actually, for a lot of those places, we were the only ones that had data for those areas. So um, we became a huge part of the MPA baseline um, monitoring in all regions um, and creating like that that uh, ability to uh, compare. Uh, what it looks like now to the past, but that only can be done with uh, continuous long-term monitoring. So we still have to go back every year so we can we can uh, note all the changes. Uh, so these are all the papers that came out, you know, North Coast, Central Coast, South Coast, uh, and then uh, there's been papers that show, you know, um, uh, where we caught the range expansion of, of, uh, of an urchin that came from Mexico. Uh, yeah, so just saying that this data has been heavily used for a lot of things, especially now that we're talking about this. Uh, papers are coming out, I think two came out yesterday. Uh, papers are coming out left and right about, you guys have probably heard, the urchin barrens that are going on in uh, specifically Northern California. We see them in Southern California too, but Northern California is getting, getting hit the hardest. Um, and so um, uh, basically it's, you know, this phase shift from a, a kelp dominated reef uh, to a eventually urchin barren where there's nothing left but rock and urchins. Um, so you can see a forest like this. This is actually bull kelp near Assistus, which is the main kelp up in up north, um, going to something literally like this, um, a very, very uh, heavily dominated uh, urchin. Uh, sustained urchin barren. And in the, the, the part, uh, I'm not going to tell you the whole story because that's a whole nother PowerPoint and, and lecture, but um, basically, you know, there was a combination of the uh, El, El Nino and climate change and a heat wave uh, that, that uh, caused a disease to occur that killed off all of these uh, sea star predators of the urchins. The urchins happened to have this huge um, uh, 
uh, like spawning event and then uh, like bam it was just like this whole crazy um uh you know a perfect storm of events and effects and you know and then you get overfishing in there and all this kind of stuff that happened and that in turn caused a a, a huge decline um in uh, abalone up north as well so um so that's that's a story there's lots of articles and lots of information about that so if you want to know more reach out i've got plenty of plenty of things that you can look at and videos and everything so another thing that long-term monitoring can capture is uh and i'm sure you guys know this in florida is uh invasives and uh and range expansions um, so uh, a, 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 a common um, and very scary invasive we have, this is uh, sargasm um, and it is from uh, Asia. Uh, we have two of them, but this has been the most prolific and has really taken over the reefs, especially in Southern California. Um, so this, uh, where this diver is trying to count fish through all this stuff, uh, this used to be a full on uh, lovely macrocystis kelp forest and now it is a, a field of very tall uh, sargasm horneri. So um, yeah, it's obviously uh, made a huge effect on, on our reefs uh, here as an invasive species. And then uh, down below we have this really cute guy. He's really, they're really cute and they're very, they think they're, they're like, uh, chihuahuas they think they're huge and they'll come after you even though they're they're only like you know um uh 10 centimeters long um so uh yeah so being able to see these and see so we started seeing these come in and we've been now tracking them uh they're really cool but they're not supposed to be here originally they're uh from uh from mexico basically even even south of baja they have just moved their way up um, so we don't know what the effects of them coming in as a new species, whether it's just going to add to the diversity or they're going to actually uh, be competitive and, and eliminate some of the diversity and outcompete some of the, the endemic species that live here. So it's very, very important to monitor these guys. This is a sexy male. This is what they, the color they turn into whenever they uh, go into breeding season. And it's just, they're gorgeous and their eyes are so pretty, but uh, yeah feisty little guys and I'm not sure what they're doing to to our, our guys that were already living here. So how to get involved with Reef Check California and you guys um, will have a Reef Check uh, Florida there too and I'm, I don't have a lot of information on that so you can talk to Nessie about that but if you're coming out here for any reason uh, you know you can you can look at our training schedule and 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 find a training and you book it and you take the training and then you can come diving with us. Um, so we also have within California a, an education program that's very important um, that we are working uh, working to get those um, inner city kids and some of these kids, even though they live within like literally five, 10 miles from the ocean, they've never actually been to the ocean. And it's does it doesn't seem to make any sense, but it's very, very true. Um, so this is a very awesome opportunity for them to feel connected to the ocean. Any kind of education is 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 great whenever it's it's coming to this kind of stuff. So this really um, uh, gives them that ability to have that link um, to to the to the marine realm. Um, and then uh, just my acknowledgments, um, since I've been here, I've met all of these people from different walks of life, uh, you know, um, uh, old, young students, uh, doctors, nurses, veterinarians, construction workers, uh, yeah, um, awesome, awesome people. So, um, and just lovely, uh, lovely experience, lovely times. And um, yeah, and that's that's it from my end. Um, here's some information for you if you want to contact me or if you want to look up uh, Reef Check. Um, on uh, we have a lot of articles and stuff that you can read uh, from all over the world and from California. So um, yeah, so that's it for me. Um, what time do we have? Let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing right now. Uh, what time is it? Oh, it's 4.39. I do have, it's a five minute video that just kind of, that I put together. It's not nothing fancy, but it just kind of shows uh, the different kelp forests along the coast of California. Do you guys think you'd be interested in seeing that? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Yay. Okay, good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, let me share my screen again. Oh, let me do this again. No, I think we'll, I think we'll be okay. Uh, 
let's see. There we go. That's what happens when you have 100 windows open. You can't find the one you want. And then, uh, you said on the left hand side, Anesti, that I should. Is oh, it when I'm sharing? When, yeah, when you when you go to share, when you select the window. Okay, let me go back. Share. Yeah, so in that dialogue oh, window. Oh, sure, so I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. There you go. Got it. Okay. And of course it moved. Okay. And then go here. This is epic. See you in a bit. Can you guys hear that? Yeah, we can hear. Yeah.
Okay. That was 2020. You could tell from all the masks. <laughs> <laughs> Except when they were underwater. That was the only time. <laughs> and, and technically, you could say they still had masks on. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were cheating. Oh, let me turn this on. Cool. So, yeah. do you have any questions from anybody? Well, I just wanted to say first, thank you so much, Dr. McMillan. This is a great presentation uh, around your academic journey and, and where you are today and um, great overview of ReefCheck. And uh, before we get into questions, because there may be some questions about this that I want to kind of put this information out there first as well, is um, I just got off the phone yesterday or the day before. It's been a long week, folks. Um, with Jan uh, Freywald uh, over at ReefCheck Foundation. He's the executive director of all of ReefCheck. And um, we've come to an agreement where I will be the ReefCheck Florida coordinator um, starting this summer. Uh, I have some, some extra training to go through, which I'll be, uh, is already lined up for May. So we're getting that taken care of. Um, that, that was an ordeal that Dr. Mimelin knows is familiar with but we're getting it taken care of. Thanks in, in part to a large support from ReefCheck Foundation to be able to help revitalize the ReefCheck Florida program. And so uh, I have a vested interest in putting together uh, not just teams of veterans with my organization, USX, that I run, but also with universities and scuba clubs like ours here at Florida Tech. I've been in contact in the uh, recent past with University of Miami Scuba Club. They're 400 members deep. Uh, we could definitely, you know, help uh, partner with them in a lot of ways. Um, it, and ReefCheck Florida is really focused on uh, coral bleaching that, that's happening here, as well as um, coral uh, stone disease uh, that's happening as well. So there's a lot of focus around that and monitoring that uh, and, and assessing those. There's a lot of stuff to do in Florida, I have to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to be offering training through the scuba club, uh, most likely in the fall. Uh, to be able to help rally people together. We're going to be going down south. The I think the northernmost ridge of our coral system in Florida goes up to like Boca Raton, uh, all the way down oh, into wow. the east. And so we're a little further north, but I think, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, any excuse to go down past, you know, Boca Raton, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, into the Keys is, uh, is a good day. So um, we'll I have, yeah, I have one of my, one of my volunteers, uh, that because of COVID had to move to Arizona and he still comes back like a <laughs> lot. <laughs> yeah. You can't like he go, makes that drive. So yeah. <laughs> you can't go wrong with the you keys. Get in the water. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, that's some exciting news. That's something very new, very fresh. Not even Dr. McMillan really knew that, but I will be the reef check Florida coordinator, uh, here, Woo! um, this summer. Um, I'm working closely with Alex Brilski, who uh, is an amazing instructor and educator. He's actually a Florida Tech alum. He got his PhD here at Florida Tech in oceanography. Um, I won't say how many years ago, and I'm sure he'll be pleased with that, but um, he's a former professor. He was a professor for about 10 years at uh, Florida Keys College uh, down, down there. And he still continues to run uh, programming and educational. Uh, so he's, he's really the educational kind of director of sorts for for reef check florida reef check tropical and um but I, I will be able to instruct um you know uh, ground level you know volunteer scientific you know citizen science divers to be able to go out and, and i'll be coordinating the logistics of planning surveys things of that nature so there's going to be a lot of a lot of really cool things in the works uh, around that for how you can get involved That's awesome. directly here and admittedly i went through reef check florida training uh, i've been connected with reef check since 2017 uh full disclosure I went through ReachCheck California training with Dan Abbott, who was an amazing instructor, really pivotal in, you know, um, contributing to my knowledge of, of science and, and citizen science that really helped get me to where I am today, uh, outside of my academic track that I'm currently in, to be able to be the executive director of a citizen science-based research agency uh, of my own. And so, uh, you know, um, you know, it's a big part of why I wanted to bring Dr. McMillan in to be able to talk about the organization and, and share her journey and, and what she does um, and really introduce the club uh, and the Florida Tech community to what ReefCheck is doing because it's a lot of amazing things. It's citizen science bringing everyday ordinary people like Dr. McMillan said, janitors to lawyers to uh, plumbers to, you know, auto repair mechanics, you know, you name it, you know, 
uh, especially in California of all places, you've, you've got Silicon Valley software engineers and, and you know, more blue collar salt of the earth kind of people all on the same boat doing the same work, uh, following the same protocols. And it's amazing to see so many different diverse people coming together. And, uh, and we're gonna be revitalizing that in a lot of ways here in Florida as well. And uh, That's fantastic. yeah, with that said, uh, we've, we've got about uh, eight, nine minutes left. Let's uh, open it up to any questions. I know I have a few, but I wanna make sure um, we've got a few participants here live to, to ask any questions. Hey, uh, Dr. McMillan. Um, so I, I don't actually have a question per se, but but I, I wanna say a thank you for um, your talk. Uh, I found it very, interesting and it's actually um this is actually something i've been wanting to try to do since i got into scuba diving so and but i had no idea where to do that or how to get started so um now that you've come and spoke spoken to to us i now know and since i'm a student here at fit um i guess now that anesti is in is in charge of the group down here um i could guess i can get um started in on it and then He's making it really easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's putting it on a platter. He's like, and by the way, here you go. No, that's awesome, Anderson. I know it's it's really, and that's, I think that, you know, you, you know, not all the dives uh, are awesome. And I mean, I think all, all, all diving is awesome, but you know, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's rough, but people keep coming back because it is exactly the way you were just describing. It's like that, that ability to feel like you're, you're giving back, you're diving with purpose, right? That's our, that's our uh, catchphrase. So it really does make a difference when you, when you feel like you're a part of, part of something and you're surrounded by people that also believe in that, you know, so it, it makes for, makes for a good time. Mm -hmm. Well, and absolutely. it's very important work. Yeah, it's not just fun. That's number three. Number one, safety. Number two is data. Number three is fun. We still have fun, but that's number three. <laughs> yeah, and the, the networking and the friends you make are are profound. Like I've I've um I've had the pleasure of meeting Dr. McMillan. Like we dove Big Sur together 2018 or 2017? 2018. Yep. Yeah, 2018. 2017. It's been I don't it's been no 2018. Year. Yeah, 2018. you're right, you're right. <laughs> yeah, 20, 2018, we dove Big Sur together. That was, uh, that was, that was, uh, I tell people. Spicy like, and dynamic. <laughs> yeah, those are good <laughs> words to describe it. So any of you who dive here in Florida thinking like, you know, anything, anything less than 30 or, you know, feet of, or so of visibility, you know, is, is a bad day. I, I urge you to go to California and um, that's where I became an instructor. And so I tell my, I was telling my students there, if you can learn how to dive in California, you're going to be golden anywhere else, pretty much in the world you go, because California is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's relatively easier diving in like SoCal, C Catalina, Channel Islands, San Diego was a lot of fun. Uh, NorCal, very, very salt of the earth, <laughs> you know, um, not for the faint of heart diving uh, from anywhere north of San Francisco. And even Monterey gets pretty dicey sometimes as well, right there in Central California. But I've had the pleasure of meeting some amazing people who have really been inspired by Dr. McMillan is, is one of, of quite a few. Um, Tristan McHugh, Dan Abbott, um, Michael Acid, who is now a member of the USX team. You, you'll be hearing from him next week. He's gonna, uh, next month rather, I'm sorry. Uh, he's our next guest that I'll be announcing here in a minute. And, um, you know, you just, you just, it's really cool to be able to meet people with different perspectives, different backgrounds to come together for one common purpose. Uh, which is to to monitor and care for the the coastlines and the oceans, and that's that's a beautiful thing that that doesn't go away, and you you build lifelong friendships from that. I uh, I wanted to ask and just, you, yeah, and just one more one more um, uh, very big uh, uh, advantage to getting uh, trained by reef check, and I hear this from people that found out that it, you know it was too too much for them to, to do, um, uh, but they love the class because it really makes all those things that you see in the ocean and you're like, oh, there's a fish, there's a blue fish, there's a yellow fish. It kind of makes them become your friends because then you know who they are because you've been trained in identification. So you're like, then then you it just makes your dives so much more interesting because then you start looking for those rare ones or you start looking for your favorite, you know, whatever, so yeah. It's it, that's that's another component of, of taking the training as well. Yeah, absolutely. The training alone is extremely valuable um, in being able to, especially as I um, became an instructor, I was still very early, very early on in my academic career and the work, the training that I went through with Dan Abbott was very informative. And I went as an instructor and guiding my students, I went from like, hey, did you see that blue fish? Did you see that red fish over there? Now I'm like, 
you know, knowing the names of these things. And Dan was full of like fun and very interesting facts. Some of them not so kid friendly about some of the some of the the wild. Whatever there. works to help you remember. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm totally <laughs> about that. That just helps you remember these these really cool things that uh that, that you know that you learn and share over time that um that really add a lot of value to to my diving, um to appreciate things more to be able to be more detailed in my dive logs which kind of serves as my journal you know my archival journal that I'm going to pass on to my children you know because diving is a big part of my life that I want to be able to pass on and so um very valuable training and uh, admittedly. Reef Check Florida training isn't as, because I've gone through both now, and it's not nearly as robust as Reef Check California. Reef Check California is extremely comprehensive. Like I have a, a stack of index cards like this thick of, of like- We've added I think more. Like tw 20, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you have. Like 27 species of fish alone, let alone yeah. algae and invertebrates. Yeah. yeah, and so um, you learn a lot. It's fun though. And it's great to cross train too. So when you get involved in Reef Check Florida, you know, you you have an open pass to pop over to California anytime and, you know, over the summer and um, tag along in the class. The protocols, some of the protocols are a little different, but you'll get a, um, acquainted with that over there and, you know, we'll, we'll make it work. And I, I can, you know, work with you in advance if you ever want to go to California because uh, kelp forests are majestic and amazing. And if you can get past the, you know, 48 to 52 degree water, um, it's it's a beautiful sight to behold. And uh, you know, very. It's a little. It depends on when you come. I, I can help. We can get it up to seventy sometimes. Yeah. Maybe maybe like November is a great time in in Catalina. It's seventy and like forty to fifty foot viz. It's awesome. Tur sea turtles. Come on. I mean, you guys probably see sea turtles. We're like, oh my god, it's a sea turtle. Um, but yeah. But you got you got so. large sea bass. Garibaldi's are a lot of fun. It's a state fish of California. In fact, I remember when I went my first surveys, I had a. I felt a big tapping in my head. You got this big, thick seven mil wetsuit on. And I feel like pop, pop, pop in my head. I'm like, you know, my dive buddy, like, bro, you could just shake my fin. Why you got to tap me in the head for? And I turn around, and I don't see my dive buddy. He's further there along on the transect. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I, and then I finally see, and it's a Garibaldi just popping me in the head because apparently I was near a nesting area and they're very territorial. So um, yeah, just like what you Vicious. mentioned, one of those invasive species, like they feel like they're chihuahuas. But yeah, I wanted to yeah, ask yeah. you, like you, you did your PhD in Auckland, right? University of Auckland. Like what, what inspired you to, to, to go there versus staying like stateside? The scholarship. The scholarship? <laughs> that Free makes money. sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that, that, and, you know, I did have uh, two kids at the time and, and trying to navigate, like, you know, I had struggled. I had been working full time while going to school full time. I'm sure some of you guys can relate. And, um, and just the idea of not having to uh, keep taking out loans or, or searching for grants or search, searching for scholarships um, was uh, really um, uh, a very big draw. But also, um, I just heard so many awesome things about New Zealand, and it was kind of like, you know, one of those things that are on your bucket list, but you never think you're going to live there. Kind of. So this opportunity mm -hmm. came along, and it was kind of like, you know, I've always been like, you know, you only live once kind of person. So um that I know of. Um, so yeah, so I, I took that opportunity. It was different. It is, it is, uh, you know, um, it is difficult to be an immigrant uh, of any kind, you know, uh, they supposedly speak English there, but there was a lot of times I had no idea what they were talking about. Uh, <laughs> but so I can't even imagine going to a country where you don't speak the, the language or don't speak the language very well, because just navigating um, the differences between where you've grown up and have lived all your life to something completely new. Um, it, it was uh, uh, difficult, it was really challenging, but I thought it was some, so necessary for, if it, everybody in the world could do that, I think the whole world would change their attitude about people, cultures, places, all that kind of stuff. Because being on the, on the receiving end of being the one that's different is, is, was, a, was a very valuable lesson. Um, so not only did I get an education in marine biology, but I got an education on on uh, immigration and and uh, yeah, living living life on, sure. um, as as yeah, from that perspective, um, yeah, and the Maori culture there, the indigenous culture there, and the museums and yeah, and um, living in a place where it's more socialized and have beautiful parks and good roads and good schools and. <laughs> Cheap medical so socialism care. Is I a, could is go another, on and on, but topic. yeah, it was very good to learn all about. That. <laughs> I'm feeling you though, I, but it's it was, 
we'll keep social. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally understand. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and it was great diving too, and I got to go to the Great Barrier. But yeah, that it was it was a huge decision, um, but uh, but I'm grateful that I was able to do that, that I had the opportunity. That's awesome. Yeah. Do we have any other questions, uh, Hannah, Ben, Anderson? Any other questions? Uh, I had a question of when you went to Santa Cruz. Did you ever think of going to Santa Barbara, maybe? Or have you heard of Santa Barbara's program? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was so um, uninformed at the time. I mean, I like I said, I'd grown up in Texas. I had never even been to California. I mean, I hadn't been to many places um, at that point in my life. Um, and so it was basically just researching online. Um, it's funny, Santa Bar UC Santa Barbara, um, I almost went there for my PhD uh, and I'm here now, but um, but I, whenever I was researching online, I came across like, um, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, like Florida, you know, all these different places, uh, even um, A&M in, in Texas, but it was more maritime stuff. But a University of California had a marine biology degree First of all, uh, second of all, they had a very, very good uh, uh, scientific diving program um, and um, a very good used to, they just closed it this year, which is horrible, but a very yeah. good um, undergraduate, um, just uh, uh, open water and, you know, um, a recreational diving program. Um, and I mean, fantastic. Uh, Santa, Cruz well, so will, Santa Cruz will argue that they, they still have the program technically, but it's, it's, it's shut down for all intents and purposes of what it used we to be. We could talk about that for an hour. We're going to, we're not, <laughs> not going to go down that hole. <laughs> no respect. Uh, um, but anyway, no. yeah, I, I, yeah. So whenever I came across, you know, again, I don't know anything and I'm, I'm looking at undergrad, not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm bare, I'm just a baby college person at this point. Um, and uh, Santa Barbara had has what it's called a, a uh, like a aquatic biology degree is what you get. I mean, they, it's not really designated as a, they have a marine science building, but you don't, that's not the degree you get. So it was very confusing. So whenever I was choosing Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz seemed like the best fit. Okay. And then I had like one more question. Sure, go ahead. Like, okay. have you noticed anything different because of COVID? Cause there's less tourists in the area to like, it goes, it, it's interesting. Uh, it goes both ways. So uh, one thing we noticed, and it's coming back now because everything's opening up, but one thing we did notice was uh, the lack of smog. But then of course, we then we had all these fires and then that came back and then it just, it, it got to the point where you weren't even supposed to go outside. So that, um, but what happened was whenever they did open up beaches for locals, uh, people cheated and went anyway. And so there was a lot of beachgoers. Um, and unfortunately, whenever they opened up uh, the um, uh, the boat launches, uh, people were going and fishing and they were fishing in MPAs because, uh, because of COVID, uh, the wardens weren't able to do their jobs as well because they had, uh, you know, the government had all these things against, you know, uh, how many people they could put on the boat. So they just didn't have, they barely have enough, uh, they, I'm not even gonna say they have enough. They barely have very much reach right now because it's a huge coastline with lots of islands, lots of space, uh, lots of ways for people to hide and be fishing those MPAs uh, illegally. But then you put COVID into it and, and they just, uh, they couldn't get out and, and do the things that they would normally do. So people were raping and pill pillaging the, it was, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that's what we saw in Southern California. I'm not sure about uh, Central and Northern, but uh, but the beaches were beaches were full. Um, whenever yeah. And like I said, it was all supposed to be locals, but um, they started having to give tickets to people that were driving from inland to come. You know, because we weren't supposed to cross county lines. And yeah, cheaters. <laughs> well, thank you. So yeah, you would think you would think the opposite. You saw it in other places, but yeah, that's what that's what we saw. We we saw we saw a lot a lot of use going on, and people were at home, right? They weren't able, and so they would be there during the week, where usually it'd be not many people there. So it was like we started doing our sur surveys during the week, and and it looked like a weekend. We're like, why are all these people here? Yeah, because they they they're yeah. <laughs> They didn't have any Zoom calls that day, you know, whatever. Apparently. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah.
So I had one quick question before we wrap up, um, you know, this uh, overarching concept around, you know, citizen science. I know you touched on it a little bit, you know, about the concept of it. And, you know, for me, it, it's, um, it's a concept that, that I was introduced to as a means of how I could apply my scuba skills to something, you know, to a good purpose instead of just fun diving and, and has led me on the, the career path that I'm on now, you know, an academic career. And I, I know that um, early on when I got in, I was introduced to this, this great debate of sorts, you know, about the validity of citizen science and, and how, how viable is the data that's being collected by these everyday people that are going out, regardless of what the training looks like, just because they don't have, you know, formal degrees in, in the sciences. And so for you, as someone who has a, a formal PhD in the marine sciences and doing what you do, working in citizen science, you know, if you want to elaborate a little bit more on, I know you said there was a couple of papers that have come out about the validity of it and, you know, how, how strong has, has uh, where's that debate shifted currently in the last few years? Well, I think, I think it's been um, having consistent uh, quality data year after year after year, even though the criticism continued to be, you know, uh, reef check, reef check shouldn't get any money to monitor because they they don't do it as well as us and and they're not true scientists. But here's the deal, and this is controversial. I mean, it's not controversial, but it's something that people don't think about, and it's the um, this thought, this understanding uh, that the people, when you say an academic institution is is collecting data, in people's minds, you're thinking like you have these like. National Geographic explorer scientist with the hat on, you know, going out in the inflatable diving, you know, and, you know, and they've, you know, been doing this for 15 years. That is so far from the actual truth because I was one of those people that was collecting data for those institutions for years and, and it ended up being actually becoming one of the head techs and was actually training other people to collect data, which is exactly what I do now. Um, and so the idea that you have these qualified uh, people with degrees doing the, re the, the data collection uh, is not true. What usually happens is that you have undergrads like yourselves, um, we sometimes call them slaves, I mean, um, interns, but um, <laughs> they, they, yeah, it, it's usually, you know, your first year you do it for free. You're, well, I, this is how I did it. This is how I've been through this. So I, I know exactly what I'm talking about. So you take, you know, you get your, uh, I mean, for institutions, you have to get your AUS, you have to be a scientific diver. So I got that straight away. And then I volunteered and worked my butt off and dove all these really cold dives and, and in and around Monterey and Big Sur and up north. Um, and then, and then, uh, uh, and was collecting all this data. I didn't have a degree. I had like, uh, you know, as far as my academic career, I had a high school degree, right? I was in college, I was taking classes, I might know a little bit more here and there, but I had to be trained just like the people that I train um, on ID, on what a swath is, on you know uh, measuring with your body to either side so you get the area, you count all the animals within the area you're supposed to count. All of that I had to be trained for and that's exactly what I train my volunteers to do. So in my mind, in a lot of times, uh, these volunteers that I work with, um, some of them are older, have been diving for 20 years, know the reef more better than I do, especially when I first started in Southern California. I think I'd only dove down here once, never been to the Channel Islands, never been, I mean, I was like brand new, not to California, but Southern California, had no idea. And I'd often like go over to one of our, you know, long-term volunteers and go, so where are we supposed to be diving? Like, where's the reef? Or did you see that thing down there? I don't, I've never seen that before, which is what I asked when I first saw that uh, largemouth blenny. I actually asked, and he was like, oh yeah, we've been getting those like the past couple of years. I think they're called, you know, and then then we then it opened up that, that idea that, oh, we should start counting these. They're starting to appear and they're not supposed to be here. Um, the, the natural history knowledge that some of these volunteers have is amazing. And, and they also, um, they're, they're doing this with, uh, with that purpose that we've talked about. They, they've chosen to do this. They're not just doing this because it'll look good on their resume whenever they apply for grad school. You know, they're serious about this. They want to keep doing this for, you know, and they have the, the knowledge um, and, you know, and like I said, they keep coming back. And a lot of them are really, really, really intelligent people that make 
way more money than I do and always come up to me and go, you know, I always wanted to be a marine biologist when I grew up, but then I became a lawyer and I live in Malibu. I mean, it's, it's totally, I'm not kidding. That's literally a conversation I had one time. Um, so just know that these citizen scientists, um, they're not, they're not stupid. They're very, very involved. And, and, you know, the quality of the training that they're getting is the exact same training that you're giving these undergrads. And some of them had just started diving the year before. So they don't even have, you know, that, um, that like awareness of, of, of the, uh, marine, uh, ecosystem that they're diving in, like somebody that's been diving for 20 years in California, you know? So, um, so that's my, that's my take on it. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's it's one I, I agree with, but it's it's good to to have that reinforced by someone in, in your yeah. Position. Well, I just, I just think it's just a, a common misunderstanding about like wh who who's collecting this like uh, this academic data. It's like well, it's a bunch of you know. <laughs> undergrads I, i've had like free. looks now into academia and i, I firmly confirm and agree like <laughs> <laughs> on so many yeah. levels so it's uh, yeah it's a it's a hot take but it's an accurate one i think and so yeah 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 you know, that this, is true in this controversy yeah. so I, I appreciate your insight to that uh before we wrap up are there any other further questions before we close out going once all right well Thank you, Dr. McMillan, for your time. Thank you so much, guys. Knowledge. This is fun. Yeah, thank you so much. This is this is we really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and insight with these things, and um, really helps serve as a as a foundation of of knowledge uh, moving forward, especially with the the revitalization of Reef Check Florida uh, and the you know the vitality there and the the potential there uh, to be able to rebuild this program here. Uh, at Florida. And so um, very much appreciate your time and, and effort. Uh, again, this is hosted by the Florida Tech Scuba Club, a student organization at the Florida Institute of Technology. They're a student organization around recreational scuba diving that serve as a pipeline into scientific diving, field research, and professional development through scuba. My name is Anesti Vega. I am the president of the scuba club. You can find more information at www.floridatechscuba.org. And for more information on our presentation this evening, you can check out www.reefcheck.org and uh, with further links there to many of the sister sites throughout the world that Reef Check Foundation has. Uh, any last words, Dr. Mimlin, before we close? No, yeah, just keep doing what you guys are doing. All right, well, thank you again, guys. And come visit and come see us in California. I'll come see you in Florida and you come see us in California. That sounds like a plan. Thank you so much, Dr. McMillan. Appreciate your time. No worries. Thank you, guys. All right. Have a good night, everyone. You too. You too. Bye.